Rising from the Willamette Valley ecoregion in the north and the Klamath Mountains ecoregion in the south, the Cascade Mountains of Oregon are a heavily forested mountain range with a sharp divide in geography, climate, and ecosystems between the wetter west and the drier east. While the Cascades hold a wide variety of trees, in general, the Douglas fir dominates the western slopes, forming dense, lush forests in environments that may receive up to 120 inches of rain annually. As elevation increases, the forests change to mixed conifer forests, finally changing to ponderosa pine-dominated forests as the slopes drop into the much drier east side of the range. Both sides of the Cascades experience different fire regimes and require different management techniques, but all areas have been altered to a greater or lesser extent by a long-standing policy of fire suppression. On both sides, the fires are strongly seasonal, with wetter winters and springs promoting plant growth before dry summers leave ecosystems vulnerable to summer and fall fires. Historically, the western Cascades have generally experienced a mix of somewhat infrequent to moderately frequent mixed severity fires and infrequent high severity fires depending on the location. Fire return intervals vary significantly across the large area, but are often thought to be historically over 200 years in many locations. Though not a constant threat, most old growth trees can expect to experience at least one fire in their lifetimes, and species have adapted to survive accordingly. Likewise, a variety of native species have adapted to take advantage of the opportunities present in the post-fire, early seral environment. A large reason why the Douglas fir is so dominant in the Western Cascades is because of how well adapted it is to the region's fire regimes. The Douglas fir is a fairly shade intolerant species that is able to quickly establish itself on newly burned areas through surviving seed trees. It grows quickly in the wet climate using a fire escape strategy to attempt to outgrow the risk of fire as fast as possible. Once established in the canopy, it concentrates its foliage in the upper bowl dropping lower branches to decrease the potential ladder fuel effects. Its bark also thickens, allowing it to survive fires that kill more thinned bark species. Even if the tree is killed by a fire, its cones are relatively good insulators and seeds can still mature in scorched cones on fire-killed trees and later disperse out into the area under certain conditions. Due to its drier climate, the eastern Cascades have historically featured fire regimes of shorter fire return intervals with less intense fires than their western counterparts. Though fire return intervals can vary widely, the return interval may be 35 years or less in many areas, which historically has led to open, park-like structures with well-stocked overstories composed of a few relatively large trees spaced apart. Due to policies of fire suppression, underbrush that was previously controlled by fires has built up across the area and mean tree abundance has increased more than four times with basal areas doubling in certain areas, greatly increasing tree density. This buildup of more and smaller trees has caused difficulties for the eastern Cascade's most dominant tree, the ponderosa pine. The ponderosa pine is well adapted to the conditions of repeated, low severity fires that were the fire regime historically prevalent in the region. Fire creates favorable seedbeds for ponderosa pine seedling establishment that can lead to regenerations of up to 20,000 seedlings per acre. When surface fires do occur, the thick bark of mature ponderosa pines insulates them from fire, and when a tree is only two inches in diameter, it may already have bark a quarter inch thick. Like Douglas fir, ponderosa pine attempt to escape fires with their height. However, even if this fails and their canopy ignites, this is not always fatal. Large, mature trees can sometimes even survive a 100% crown scorch if their buds, which have protective outer scales, are not all killed. Unfortunately, large is the keyword, and with the history of logging in the area, the average size of ponderosa pine uh, has been greatly reduced. Smaller trees are more likely to be killed by fires that do occur, and with the slower growing conditions of the drier east, those large fires and drought-tolerant trees that still remain are essentially irreplaceable given the several centuries that are required to grow any replacements. Total fire suppression has also increasingly favored shade-tolerant competitors of ponderosa pines that are better able to grow in the denser closed canopy forest the absence of fire has allowed, letting these competitors increase in number in all but the driest environments. Since the late 1890s, the land in the Oregon Cascades has been mostly controlled by the United States federal government through a series of variously organized national forests. After the Great Fire of 1910, the U.S. Forest Service began an extensive campaign of wildfire suppression, 
perhaps best summarized by the 1936 10 a.m. policy that stated a wildfire should be contained by 10 a.m. the next morning after it was reported. By 1967, fire management costs were increasing exponentially, and it was being recognized that attempts at absolutely excluding fire from some ecosystems were having environmental and management consequences, leading the Forest Service to loosen its policies on some early and late season fires. This liberalization of fire policy has continued as the benefits of fire and the risks of its exclusion in forests have become better understood. This legacy of fire suppression has had a wide range of outcomes across the Oregon Cascades, with the biggest alterations occurring to the areas that were accustomed to more frequent, less severe fires. Across both sides, the trend broadly seems to be that the wetter areas are experiencing fewer patches of high-severity fire, while the drier areas are experiencing increases in high-severity fire from historical norms. However, while fires in the wetter areas may not be experiencing an increase in the total acreage severely burned, the geography of the burns they are experiencing is increasing. The few fires that are not contained generally occur under the most severe fire conditions that make early containment difficult or impossible. Once they begin, the abnormally high understory fuel loads left behind by a history of fire suppression fuel explosive increases in both acreage burned and severity. What this looks like on the ground is that in an area that frequent low intensity fires previously kept looking like this, fire suppression lets the understory build up to this, to this, to this, to this, and finally ending up like this. Though these fires are eventually brought under control, this new pattern of fewer but larger severe fires has had significant consequences environmentally and economically. This concentration of severely burned areas has contributed to a decrease in early cerebral habitat that many native species prefer. Across the Pacific Northwest as a whole, where similar fire suppression trends are occurring, greater than 40% of all species listed as threatened or endangered were either partial or facultative users of early seral pre-forest ecosystems. The Northern Spotted Owl is a good example of a species in the Cascades that has been adversely affected by the changes to the region's fire regimes. Adult owls are not at serious mortality risk from the wildfires, however they generally do not favor nesting in severely burned habitats, instead preferring to have the increased prey diversity of these early seral habitats nearby while nesting in unburned old growth stands. This preference lends itself to a mosaic landscape where the owls can nest in old growth forests that are relatively close to more open early seral habitats created by wildfires. However, this new trend of fewer, more severe fires has decreased the patchiness in the Cascades, reducing the acreage and distribution of these excellent habitats. In 2001, less than 20% of northern spotted owl territories on the eastern slope of the Cascade Range in Washington were within or near the historic range of fire frequency, and more than 43% of their habitats deviated from historical fire frequencies by multiple fire return intervals. Plant species have also been seriously affected by the lack of early seral habitats caused by fire exclusion and restricted logging throughout the Cascades. One example is the whitebark pine, which is suffering from a lack of colonizable early seral habitat on top of the introduced threat of white pine blister rust and increases in attacks by mountain pine beetles. Small, patchy fires are important to whitebark pine regeneration, especially where whitebark pine is a seral species. Large and small fires can create regeneration opportunities, recycle nutrients and biomass, and maintain whitebark pine on the landscape. Fire exclusion has instead favored shade-tolerant, late successional species across the whitebark pine's range. Even while policies have changed, social attitudes to fire have been slower to adjust, and wildfire is still generally viewed as a destructive force that should be suppressed by the public. While prescribed burns have become a preemptive firefighting tool generally accepted by the public, they are typically small in size and only done during benign conditions where the risk of an out-of-control spread is minimal. While these burnt areas do increase forest heterogeneity and assist firefighters in containing fires later on, they are a far cry from restoring the area's natural fire regime. Instead, they are often done to aid in protecting a specific area from future wildfires or to improve the habitat of a relatively small area. Unfortunately, this legacy of fire suppression has created a positive feedback effect on public opinion, where fire suppression leads to larger fires, which in turn creates public pressure to increase fire suppression, 
which in turn continues the pattern of larger fires. A case study in one of these large, uncontained fires can be seen in the efforts to contain the B&B complex fires that burned the crest of the Cascades west of the town of Sisters in 2003. Initially beginning as two separate lightning-sparked fires on August 19th, about 15 miles apart, the fires quickly spread, bolstered by severe fire conditions, including winds of up to 30 miles per hour. The timing of the fires at the end of a long, dry summer also ensured that fuel sources would be as dry as possible. By the end of the first day, the two fires had consumed 2,200 acres, and despite over 1,400 personnel at work fighting the fire, over the next six days, aided by forest areas with heavy fuel loads, the fires expanded rapidly and grew to 38,881 acres. Persistent, severe fire conditions allowed both the fires to grow eastward and westward over the next two weeks, including jumping established fire containment lines to the point where they merged into one large conflagration. The eventual onset of cooler temperatures and rainfall allowed containment to progress until the fire was officially declared contained on September 26th, more than a month after it had started. The fires finally clocked in at over 90,000 acres burned at a total cost of $38.7 million to suppress. The vast majority of the burned area was in the Deschutes and Willamette National Forest, with less than 5,000 of the burned acres occurring in areas outside federal control. Though Oregon's Cascades are far from a single ecosystem, it can be said that there is a general divide in fire ecology between the wetter west and the drier east. While both sides have had their fire regimes altered by long-standing policies of fire suppression, the eastern forests have felt this change more severely, with their historical regime of frequent low or medium severity fires being converted to infrequent stand-replacing fires that burn across large areas. Despite the ecological consequences of this policy, it is not likely to be dropped anytime soon, and special considerations will need to be taken to support species that rely on burned areas for habitat or regeneration and are suffering as a result of the shift from historical fire patterns. If locals and policymakers can be convinced of the need to break out of this cycle of total fire suppression and large severe fires, it may be possible to shift to a more open policy of cautiously allowing some fires to burn their natural course under favorable conditions. If this policy shift is not possible, an expansion in controlled burns and other simulations of natural fire regimes will be necessary to increase habitat mosaics and slow the spread of those large fires that will inevitably still occur.